If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, we're, we are catching up on a story of a man of God by the name of Elijah. And Elijah's in a moment. Say a moment. You, you ever had a life catch you in a moment? <laughs> you ever had a moment? A, a moment where you thought, God, where did that come from? Or God, why did that happen? Or God... I don't even know who I am, or I don't even know who you are in this moment. It's moments. Moments make our life. And, and, and sometimes there's moments of, of greatness, and sometimes there's moments of difficulty. But God uses all the moments. He says it this way, that I work all things together for those. Not some, not portions, not the good, not the nice, not the easy. No, I work all things together because my presence is about your life. God's presence makes everything greater in your life. Amen? L listen, uh, wherever you are on the journey, G God's presence changes everything. That when you step into God's presence, it moves, it anoints, it develops, it strengthens, it builds, it gives vision, it gives anticipation, it creates excitement. There's something about the presence of God, but you, you got to be careful because sometimes we... We think about the presence of God as a place we go to. I go to church and God's there, and that is a great thing, and God is here, and God is doing great things, but God wants you to take his presence with you. He's not asking you to come to the presence. He's asking you to join the presence of God. That God's presence, no matter where you are, where you're at, or what you're navigating, is where you are. It's around you. And Elijah is in a moment, and I want to read this, and then we'll jump into some explanation of where he is in his life and in his ministry and what God is doing in the life of Israel, God's people. It says this in verse 1, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he may die. I have had enough. Lord, he said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. It's unique because when we find the prophet Elijah, we find him in a vicarious moment. We find him in a somewhat fractured moment. But I, I find it unique because he's coming off the heels of the supernatural because in chapter 18, Elijah actually goes to Mount Carmel where he addresses and confronts the prophets of Baal that is leading Israel in Baal worship. They're leading Israel away from the presence of God, and he steps on Mount Carmel to bring them back into the presence of God. And on Mount Carmel, he says, well, let's, let, let's test who God is. There, there's a boldness about Elijah that's like a lion. There's faith that's that, that, that permeating out of him. He steps on this mountaintop and he declares things of God. And in the moment of his declaration, God brings fire to consume a sacrifice. Not only a sacrifice, but everything around the sacrifice. And God becomes God in the life of Israel again. And Israel turns their hearts to God. And when they do, they kill the prophets of Baal, which is a, is a symbol of r removing what was and stepping into what God wants. Because there's something about getting in the presence of God. And so you look at Elijah's life, and as he's standing in the presence of God, God is doing the miraculous. He, he leaves them out in Car from Mount Carmel, and he goes in, into isolation, and he begins to pray to God that it would rain, because rain hasn't fallen for three and a half years because of a drought of disobedience within Israel. And so he begins to cry out for God, and God begins to build a cloud in the distance the, the, that says that there was a cloud the size of a man's fist. And as soon as he saw just the sign of rain, by faith he declares to everyone, saddle up, 
and move into the valley, for I hear the sound of a great rain. There, there are moments that are just so big, one after another, that God is doing great things in the life of Elijah. And he starts declaring by faith, God is going to bring a rain. And, and as the rain comes and the chariots are going down, into the valley, it says that he wraps his cloak around him and the Spirit of God comes on him where he runs so fast he begins to pass everyone that was ahead of him. I mean, it's an incredible moment. And then he wakes up on Monday. <laughs> and there's a messenger that comes and says, Elijah, I don't know if you know, but I was down at the post office and Jezebel's got your picture you're one of the most wanted people, and she's going to kill you by today. You would think Elijah would say, who does that woman think she is? I just called fire down from heaven. I mean, it's raining today. Monsoon is here. Man, tell her, forget you. God's doing great things, but he doesn't. <laughs> it's crazy how you can be so caught in the spirit and so controlled by your flesh at the same time. It's unique that God is in so in love with humanity that we're tossed many times by our faith and by our fear. That sometimes we have a great belief and other times we're looking for a belief. That sometimes we have great resolve and we're standing in a conviction that is powerful and life-changing and it's motivating us to move forward. And then other times it's like we're stepping backwards. That is what I love about God's scripture. That when God wrote this Bible, that he didn't give you the highlights of people's lives. He, he wasn't just giving you the pluses and, and the good stuff. Kind of like, you know, sometimes at church how we are. Most of us at church, most of us. <laughs> Not all of us. Don't, don't elbow anyone or look and go, yeah, I know who you're talking about. But most of us, when we come to church, we have our, like, our best on, right? I mean, we might have tried to kill our children in the car, or getting them ready. We might have told them that they were going to see Jesus today. <laughs> but by the time we got to church, we closed the door, we put our smile, hey, praise God, brother. And our kids were like, what? You were just threatening me. <laughs> Remember what you said? If I didn't put my shoes on, what you're going to do to me? In the name of Jesus, silence, my child. Because we, we love the highlights, and we love reading the highlights of God's Word, but, but when you look through these pages, it's not filled with highlights. It's filled with humanity. And it's filled with humanity that, that God comes, and His presence changes the moments. He changes the circumstances. He heals those that, are, that, that need healing. He restores those that need restoring. He, he's after people. But, but, but what changes lives isn't just God after you. It's when we become after him. It's when our hearts come after the things of God. When our hearts begin to be pushed past our humanity, past our issues, past our personalities, past our struggles, and we step into the presence of a God that believes in us. Believes in us when we're wondering if we can believe in ourselves. Believes in us when we're questioning if we even believe in him. Believes in us when we're wondering if God's going to show up and work out what he said he was going to show up and work out. And that's where we find Elijah. Uh, Elijah's in the moment where he declares and he has seen God do incredible things, but he becomes overwhelmed by the moment. You know what the devil does is the devil maneuvers. His maneuver is to push you out of the spirit because he can't manipulate your spirit. He can only manipulate your flesh. He moves you out of the presence of God so he can manipulate your flesh because your flesh, listen to me, your flesh will weaken your spirit. The, the Bible says it this way, that the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. That the spirit is willing and wanting to do it, but sometimes we live in the emotion of who we are or the flesh of who we are or, 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 or the sin of who we are. That we live in the shame of who we are instead of the victory of who we are. That if not careful, we're dictated by, by, by our flesh when our spirit is calling out for so much more. That the spirit of God in your life, the presence of God in your life, 
moves you into an action. When God moves in the life of Elijah at the ravine, God brings the ravens to feed him. And he spends time with God at the ravine. See, we love to talk about the mountaintop of what God did, but we forget the time that Elijah said, no, I'm going to take my time with God. I'm going to spend my moment in his presence, and in his presence, God's going to build me. We, we love to talk about David slaying the giant Goliath, but we forget to talk about David spending time in the presence of God in a field when no one saw him, when no one knew him, when no one cared about him. See, what I've come to realize is that in the quiet moments of my life develop the public moments of my life. That when I take moments with God, God opens doors that I can't open and he closes doors that I can't close. That, that in his presence, he begins to move in my life in a supernatural way. That in his presence is why I'm here today. That in his presence is what motivated me to believe that there was more for my life than just what I was told. That, that God wants to do something great in our life. And that's why we have to secure the presence of God in our life. See, I know this can be so elementary that, well, we know it's about the presence, but yet we miss the presence so many times. That in moments of crisis, we have to wonder, what is it that we reach for? Because what we reach for is truly what we worship in our crisis. When life is down, when moments are difficult, what do you reach for to get you through the moment. Are you reaching towards God's presence or are you reaching something that will just numb, will just help, will just motivate, will just get you through a moment instead of getting you into his presence? What God has. The, the power and the presence of God it is so life-changing and that we've got to guard it. it. It says in Ephesians 6 that we're to Put on the full armor of God. L listen, you know what God is saying here, right? He's saying to put on all of my presence, not just some of my presence. I, I know we call it the armor of God, but really it's the presence of God. It it's the peace, the love, the joy, the, 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 the breastplate. It's righteousness. It's truth. It's his presence that brings all of those things. And, and, and he says in Ephesians 6 that we're to put on the full armor, to put on the full presence so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, of evil in heavenly realms. What God is saying here is, when you step out of my presence... You'll step out of your convictions. You'll step away from your anointing. You'll step into things that you never thought you would step into. You'd step into things you never thought you would do. That your mindsets change when you're outside his presence. That your convictions change when you're outside his presence. That outside his presence, there's more regret. <laughs> there's more worry. There's more concern. It lacks peace. It becomes about what you can get instead of who you are. But when you begin to step in the presence of God, you find a peace that passes all understanding. You, you find a strength that motivates you and moves you into seasons of your life you didn't know you could get to. That God's presence is something so powerful it works within our life. Sometimes if you grew up with a mom that prayed like I did, you, you weren't about the presence of God because it's like God told on you all the time. I literally, I don't know, I'm not, I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit or just the spirit of mom, but I remember literally opening the fridge. My mom would be like, you know, back in the back of the house and I would hear, as soon as I'd crack the fridge, I'd hear, David Allen, what are you trying to get out of the fridge? I'm like, She's not even here. How does she know? She was keeping me on task. And sometimes you don't want to be kept on task 
because you want to do what you want to do. You want to go where you want to go. You know what I love about God is no matter where you go, no matter where you are, his presence is still there. You cannot get away from the presence of, the God, of God. You, you can reject it, but you can't get away from it. That it's there because it wants to help you. Can I tell you something? If God's presence chased you to, for you to get here, what will it do for you to get there? See, it's crazy in our mindset. Sometimes, listen, sometimes we think that we get saved, that God's presence found us, that we gave our life to Christ, but then when we step away from his presence, that we're going to be cursed and moved and, and pushed down. No, 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 no. God's presence is still following you. God's presence is just as real in our failure as it is in our success. The difference was when when Elijah was on the mountaintop, he was going after God. But when he ran from Jezebel, I love it because it's such a great picture of who God is. Here's Elijah, he's going after God. He's declaring things in faith. But as soon as the word from Jezebel came, it turned him and he ran away from his faith. Not, not away from his gift, not away from his God, not away from even his love for God, but he ran in fear, which separates you from your faith. He didn't stand and say, no, God is going to do more. God is bigger than Jezebel. God is bringing change to Israel. He just said, whoa, Jezebel's going to kill me. I'm out. And he takes off running. And God takes off running after him. That's what I love about the presence of God is you can run into the presence of God and the presence of God will run after you. It matters what season you're in. That God loves you enough to continue to come after your life. When, when Elijah begins to move, it, it says that there's an angel that came and fed him. And Elijah is about to go to Mount Horeb, which is the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. It, it's, it's the mountain where God speaks has spoken to his people. It says this in verse 8, So he got up and he ate and drank, and strengthened by that food he traveled, watch this, 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into the cave and spent the night. There is something about a tenacity to get where God is. He is under a tree, an angel comes and feeds him, and he's telling God all of his problems. He's telling God what happened. God, I don't know if you know, but Jezebel's going to kill me. And I'm all you got, God. <laughs> I love it. I love the story of humanity. He is telling God, literally, I'm the only one left that loves you, God. You kill me. You're on your own. When we're in a moment of crisis, isn't it crazy the things we say? Isn't it crazy what fear will cause you to do? The other day we were driving, last night we were driving, or, or we were, yeah, we were driving and there was this bug in our car that created great fear in our car. And my wife was screaming and my kids were yelling at her to not to scream and, and, and it was all over something this big. But it rocked our world. And we were ready to yank the wheel into the ditch and kill that bug. I mean, it was going to kill all of us, but that bug was going to die that day. You know, when you're in crisis, sometimes you don't operate normally. You've got to have an understanding that, li listen, I, I know that maybe God's not in what's happened, but i got to get to where God is. Elijah has a commitment. He has a tenacity that says, whatever it takes, I'm going to get back to the things of God. I've got to get in God's presence. And Mount Horeb is a moment. It's monumental to the life of Israel because it was a place that God spoke. He spoke to Moses there. He spoke to Israel there. And Elijah's saying, if I could just get to the place. Can I ask you something? Have you built a place that God speaks to you? Have you built a personal place where you hear God? 
that you can run into a room or run into a moment. I, I, I'm saying it, it doesn't have to be this place. I'm, I'm glad that this place, that the house of God still speaks and prophetically speaks and communicates to your life. But, but you've got to have a place that you know. Well, we got to make a place that we find his presence. Because if you don't step into his presence, you'll probably run into something else. When you're in crisis, if you don't have a plan, you will probably run the wrong way, do the wrong thing, operate in the wrong way. I don't know if you've ever been scared and said something you shouldn't have said. <laughs> you don't have to say, yeah, that's me. You know, most people, when they slam a hammer on their finger, they don't say, ah, oh, Buddha. You don't curse like other, you know, things. You, you have a moment in crisis that, that what happens is humanity comes out a lot of times first. But you got to get it under the presence quick. You, you got to let the presence move in your life fast. Or it will take you a path. It will take you down a road of choice and choice and choice that will leave you desolate. That, that will leave you in a place that isn't where God wants you. It isn't what God wants for you. And it's not where God's taken you. But I got some news. His presence is still there. See, God's presence is so amazing that it's just, it's just a cry away. It's just a prayer away. It's just an action away. And, and that's what we find, that God sees the heart of Elijah. W worship team, why don't you come this morning? That he sees the heart of Elijah, and, and Elijah comes to the cave. But, but I want to tell you, you better be careful with cave. <laughs> God comes immediately to the life of Elijah in the cave, because why? Because in the cave, it's a hiding place, not a thriving place. God called him to thrive, not hide. He's hiding out when he should be pursuing Jehu, Elisha. Elisha. He, he should be pursuing what God has in front of him, but he's hiding because caves create comfort, but they lack conviction. Caves are places that when you research caves and the animals that live in caves most are born with sight but lose their sight because they're led by feelings instead of vision and when you're in crisis it's easy to find a cave where you're led by your feelings you're led by your emotions you're not led by your vision see sometimes you have to say i'm not worried about where i am today because i know where i'm going tomorrow I'm not worried about what's happening right now because I'm, I, I know where I'm going. But when you don't see where you're going, you're in a difficult moment. Elijah's in a difficult moment. And it says that God finds him in his moment. And God comes to him in his moment. And he says this in verse 11. I want you to see something. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord is about to pass by. Now, that's a word for someone in this room. You, you've been locked in a cave. You, you've been maybe pushed in a corner. But, but I want to declare that that the Lord is about to pass by. That the Lord is passing by your life right now. That God wants to make all things new. He wants to do something in his presence. He, he wants to move and minister in his presence. And it says that then a great and powerful wind tore through the mountains. It, it tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. 
And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? It wasn't saying, what are you doing here? It was a question of, what do you need, Elijah? Because you came to a supplier. You came to a place where I speak. You came out of the cave and stepped into my presence. We hear, what are you doing? Like God saying, gosh, Elijah, what are you doing? That's not what God is saying. God is actually saying, Elijah, you're in my presence. What do you need? I, I, I really sense that that's what the Holy Spirit is saying today to lives in this room. Is He's not saying, what are you doing? Why aren't you getting through this faster? Why don't you get better? Why don't you get whole? Why don't you get free? Why don't... He's just saying, hey. What do you need? What do you need from me today? Because Elijah, I'm here. My presence is here to do whatever you need. As much as I brought the fire and sent it to earth to create a moment of the supernatural to change the hearts of Israel, I'm at the edge of this cave bringing the presence of who I am to you to bring supernatural change for you. And it's the same for you. It's the same for me. I'm going to ask you to stand today because I am convinced that it is in his presence. It is in his presence. Maybe you're thinking you can't find his presence. Maybe you're feeling like you don't deserve his presence, but both of those are lies. Both of those statements are, are, are not biblical. Because God says, whenever you cry out, I'm, I hear you. Whenever you run to me, I find you. Whenever you seek me, you'll find me. That no matter where you are, no matter what you're going, no matter what you're navigating, even if you are angry at me, that my presence will still sustain you. It will still keep you. It will still hold you. It will still motivate you. It is when we step away from the presence of God that we step away from the things of God that we begin to pull in items within our life that say they'll bring peace. They, they fulfill for a moment, but they take from our life. They, they fulfill for a second but they remove from our destiny. But I declare that God's in this place. You feel him? His presence isn't here just because we're gathering. His presence is here because he's in love with you. His presence is here because he's for you. He's about you. He's after you. And I want us to do something today. I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads today. Travis, we're going to still go in that direction. Just, But you're here today, and you need more of the presence of God. You, you need more of the presence of God. You're in a moment. You need God's presence. Maybe you are hungry for more of God, or maybe you are wavering in your faith. Wherever you are, he's there. Whatever you're navigating, he's with you. Because his presence changes everything. It changes everything. If you'll give him a moment, he'll change. He takes hurts and brings hope. Fatigue and he brings strength. Worry 
and he brings worship. You're here today. And I want to I want to pray for you today, but I want us to go into his presence this morning. You're here today, and you need more of God's presence in your life. I want you to just look at me. I, I know I'm, I'm bipolar today. I'm telling you to close your eyes, look at me. But I really feel like this from the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we want to make it so easy, like no one's looking around, just put a pinky sometimes you just got to go after God's presence. Sometimes you just got to say, well, I don't care what they think. I don't care. I, it may take me 40 days to get to Mount Horeb, but I'm getting into Mount Horeb. It may not be the easiest path. There may be some barriers and some obstacles, but I'm, I'm, I'm hurtling things. I'm moving past things. I'm stepping because when I get to the presence, everything, everything, every, everything changes. And if you need more God in the season that you're in right now, I want you to do something. We're going to sing this song, but I want you to step out of where you are. I want you to come to this altar just right now. If you know that, you don't even have to think about it. Just, just move. You just say, yeah, David, I, I just want more God. We'll wait for you. I just need, I need God in this season of my life. I'm questioning things. I'm worrying about things. I just need him. I need him. And God's going to move on your life today. I'm telling you, God's going to move. We're, we're just going to sing this song as a church. We're going to step into the presence. And we want to pray for you if you're coming to this altar. But as a church, we want to step into the presence of God. Because God's going to do things in this house. Come on, come on, Travis. Let's sing that. Come on, just stretch your arms to heavens today. Come on, let's cry out for more of God. Let's cry out for the things of God. Yes, Lord, today, 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 today. We're after you, Lord. We're after you, Lord. Come on, worship him. You need a healing, worship him. God's going to heal you. Need some hope, worship him. Come on, say it, church. Come on, declare who he is in your life.